Zealand is, but it's based out of Shenzhen. Um, so we do all of our design, um, all of the merchandising is from our Shenzhen, our sales is from Hong Kong, um, and we now have boxes you know, worldwide. Um, and then we have some uh, different factories um, elsewhere in the world. Um, so my job there is to uh, oversee IP capture, so to, to make sure we recognize developments as they come through, to protect those, uh, and then to enforce the IP to make sure that uh, we keep our place in the market and that we keep our customers happy. Thanks. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm Anton, I come from New Zealand. Uh, I'm an Australian and New Zealand patent attorney. Um, I've been doing IP for 24 years now, uh, all with my current firm, AJ Park. And my background is in mechanical engineering, so I deal with uh, inventors with mechanical technology. Yeah, so there's been a, a lot of positive change. Um, I think China's IP system is now you know, on par with the rest of the world. Um, for a long time, the process of getting IP protection in place were, uh, have been the same as, as most of the rest of the world. Um, but their enforcement uh, provisions were fairly weak. But now enforcement in IP in China is, is really strong. Um, it's, uh, in some respects, it's, it's cheaper and potentially faster to enforce your IP rights in China than it is in the United States and Europe. So cheaper and faster to enforce IP. Yeah, I think China's really doing the best they can to, to, to welcome business from around the world to China. And to do that, uh, you know, a good IP protection and enforcement system is the first thing. I've been working on this for many years now. Now it's a good subject. So, foreign companies, as, as opposite to maybe 10 years ago and uh, more, had a way better chances to, to protect their businesses, uh, their IP actually in China, compared to. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, 10, 10 plus years ago, a lot of my clients were flying into China to deal with counterfeit manufacturing problems. Mm. Uh, but now there are many more reasons why they're flying the IP rights in China. And it's also because there's a growing consumer market for the products. Mm. So a domestic market for technology and for products and services. Um, and, uh, and as a result, that's creating more reasons for flying rights into part of the world. Do you have anything to add to this? Um, I just think that in, I guess, a lot of countries, um, IP might not be that high on the list for the government, and so you might see updates of the IP law occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but we're in a phase in China now where you're seeing uh, regular updates, and so, you know, this month uh, is coming through a new way to appeal patent cases in China. So, you know, you're just seeing update after update. How, how these updates actually are updated to, to technologies like really kind of sophisticated technologies? Uh, yeah, so, so the one that I referenced there is focused on the patent and um, IT type of emissions. Okay. Um, okay, so a lot of companies are still scared of doing, doing businesses in China. Uh, so, can you, can you a little bit explain us on this? So why, what are the consequences? I think a lot, a lot of Western companies still see China as the way it was 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, kind of the wild west in terms of intellectual property enforcement and protection. But China's patent door only came into effect in the early 80s. So it's a very, very young uh, patent system. And it's been through a lot of growing pains, I guess, at the same time. So a lot of companies have sort of just stood back and watched what was happening in this part of the world. Um, and they're only now starting to, well not now, but it's increasingly starting to get the confidence of protecting their own IP rights here. And uh, a lot of that, uh, I guess a lot of responsibility falls on the practitioners, IP attorneys, lawyers, um, the government, um, people in media to educate businesses around the world that things aren't the way that they used to be. Yeah. 
So how, how, how do you think it can be done? Uh, I mean, China is really focused on pumping out statistics on mm -hmm. the use of their patent system. Mm -hmm. yeah, there was 1.2 million patents filed in China uh, two or three years ago. Compared to the states, where there's only 600,000 filed each year. Uh, so you know, that, that's a statistic that's being put out there to say, well, hey, people are using the patent system here. Yeah, there was something like 250,000 IP enforcement actions in China in 2017, around about 1,200 or so patent infringement cases. And a lot of patent infringement cases are actually between Chinese companies, which is like an allowance to China. It's not foreign companies that you know, have products knocked off. Yes, they have them still, but a lot of the IP litigation in China is between Chinese IP rights owners. Is there any difference? Uh, it can be also a question for me. Is there any difference between being a uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign company and Chinese company within uh, Chinese uh, IP people? Do you actually judges see you differently? Because what people are afraid that, you know, like, if if, uh, if you're uh, against Chinese uh, company in the court, actually your ch chances are very very low. So. Can you, can you comment to that? The, the statistics don't show that. So, you know, these <coughs> companies are having success in that education in China. And, and the statistics are not showing that. Yeah, I, I think if you are um, a foreigner trying to uh, do documentation and get some of the like, formalities involved in getting a case off the ground, um, there are more hoops to jump through if you are not a Chinese national. Um, but I don't know that that means on a substantive level or not, but it can make this more complicated to get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, how about the, the price of, of, of uh, patents and uh, patent services compared to the US? Or maybe, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah I, I think that you can find cheap patent filing services in China. But you can in the US as well. You can find them anywhere in the world. Yeah. You know. So, uh, but you know, for a very reputable uh, organization to file patents from in China, you're paying the same as what you would be in, in the States or in Europe. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit cheaper, but I'm not sure what's going on. I don't know if we compared much stuff in China, but I know that like the Chinese patent office fees are fairly low. Like you said, offsets some of the costs that you might have otherwise. Yeah. For a patent that's been filed, for example, in, in the US or in Europe, it's then extended a little bit to China, you've got translation costs that they want to so that become quite expensive. So the English text has to be translated into Chinese to file here. Okay, now one specific question. Considering that when you're filing a patent, so the way you describe, the way you actually connect the words and uh, explain the concepts, and now uh, considering that uh, the structure of English language and actually all Latin and its Latin languages are completely different compared to Chinese language, how do you how do you uh, come up with uh, the solutions? So do you have like super good translators? Who Really know what you mean. Yeah, it's really vital to get that right. Because if you don't get it right, then it can completely destroy the value of your patent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we file patents into China, we need to use local IP firms. And there are some that have been around for many years. Um, you know, there are some that are employing over a thousand you know, people, um, including you know, a very strong translation office. Mm -hmm. Where the patent specifications have been translated, I've checked twice or three times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, like, things can get lost in translation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You can find um, patent translation services, so they will actually employ translators who have a technical background. Um, and so that the person doing the translation um, has, you know, is able to understand the technology and translate accordingly. Um, so I think that you definitely the value of your IP want to be using a um, service that has uh, appropriate value or
can how can you prevent uh, uh, coping of a virus from uh, permits in China? So what are what are some basic strategies? Usually they are let's let's talk about permit related things. Not about high tech because high tech is probably yeah, much more complex. Um, basic certain basic forms. Or yeah, yeah, forms. Like uh, protection. Uh, what, what works? What does not work? Yep. So. I mean, design habits uh, are good for the, the appearance of the product. Um, some things which are the subject of design habits, you could also file copyright uh, registrations to protect. And copyright registrations can be very quick. You can give them 10 days and very cheap. Um, but there are more rules around what can qualify uh, for copyright registration. So not all products are going to be able to be protected. Um, whereas design habits, a functional article and it's got some aesthetic appeal, you can protect it. Um, there are utility models, uh, those aren't examined unless you ask for them to be. And so there's, it's kind of like an invention pattern, um, but it takes a lot less time to get through because there's no examination. Um, so you might be able to get a broader scope of protection through quite quickly um, on a utility model. But if you ever go to enforce it in court, that will make you do some groundwork uh, to prove the validity of the internal first. Um, there's invention patterns. Um, so those are for the conceptual um, inventions, and that can be a lot broader um, than just your designs which are protecting a particular form of the product. Um, there are going to be other um, ways you can say unfair competition so if somebody is making something and presenting it and packaging it in a way that is calling to mind the product if they're doing that deliberately um, even if you don't have registered rights um, you can bring into play some of these uh, unfair competition actions um, so those are your registered uh, IP rights and you can use them um, through formal so you can Courts, um, and there's some administrative tribunals that will enforce them. Um, you can use them for online monitoring. Uh, you can use them at trade fairs to go and remove copy product. Uh, you can give them to Chinese customs and have them stop the copy product at the border. Um, so there's quite a few ways that you can use those registered IP rights to then stop uh, copies that's inside of China, and there's even more you can do outside of China. Mm -hmm. And trademarks as well, right? So brand protection. Yeah. Uh, okay, so those are also some countermeasures, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so now this is interesting for you. Yeah. So <clears throat> there is difference between the US patents uh, more like, uh, and Chinese. So the US used to be like first to file, right? And now it's first to invent. So, uh, yeah, 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 and China is China is first to file. Yeah, so so both countries are now first to file. Ah, uh, both of them. So on, 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 the, on the technology side for patents, it's it's very much the same. Mm -hmm. um, I guess for trademarks, uh, it's first to file in China, mm -hmm. uh, whereas in many of the other countries around the world, it's first to use and so on. So we've seen a number of international brands, um, people with trademark scholars, where uh, people have seen brands overseas but they haven't been registered in China. And they'll register the trademarks in China and when the international brands come to China to sell their product, they are actually infringing the trademarks for their own brands. And that's because in China there's a first to file system. And a number of other countries have the same system. So if, if I hear you well, if any <coughs> startup plans to expand to China and if they're building a strong brand, one of the first things they should do is file a, a trademark patent in China just to make sure that their name stays safe there. Yeah, and it's not expensive to do, I and mean, you have the rights to use that brand on your clients. But even big corporates have been pulled out, you know, the, the ones that can afford it, like Tesla, uh, Air Jordan, there's many brands that have been pulled out. 
that have reached the trade balance here? <laughs> no, but there, there are people who get, people here are actually like monitoring and watching and making a business out of that. Yeah. Like being on the phone line to the other end of one of these people who's like got your trademark um, and he knows the process, he knows how long you're going to have to go through to court to fight this. Um, you know, he's telling all these things back to you. Um, and we've had people register even like not very big brands, brands that hadn't launched yet, but they've actually been monitoring our overseas trademark filings. Um, and so they've seen us put, you know, one trademark in somewhere um, and then deliberately tried to register um, before we did. Um, and there are, and I believe that being able to attack registrations with bad faith filings, um, that is more doable in China now, it can be done. Um, but like I said, there's someone whose entire business model is to look, look for these registrations and make them in China. Um, so and to sell them back to the yeah. actual brand owner. And uh, can they actually, I've heard, so I don't know uh, if it's true, but I promise, that if you have a trade, if, if a Chinese person that actually does that, uh, has a uh, patent, uh, sorry, trademark register, and even if you try to produce your things in China, they can still stop you in the customs if they really want. Yes. So it can be really messy, right, if you don't. Yeah. But can you, can you somehow get a, a trademark back? Yeah, if it's, if it's been registered in what was called bad faith. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. if it's your licensed manufacturer that's decided to register your trademark, then that would be a case of bad faith trademark registration. And there's a few other grounds for this. It costs money, uh, it takes time. Um, and some brands have just walked away from their trademark in China. Uh, like there's a couple of New Zealand wine labels that have got a, a wine brand that is selling to the world. And in China, they need to pull up something different. They're just putting the trademark back from one of these very nice ones. Yeah, what did one of the trademark spotters told me that he reckoned that the brand um, was worth the salary of 10 of our employees, and so that's what we should offer him to get the mark back. That's a good idea. Uh, yeah, that was, cool. his, that was his calculus for how much we should care to pay him for our trademark. The, the salary of 10 employees, yeah. <laughs> and the year of salary? <laughs> yeah, yeah but he was not specific at this point, but yeah. Okay. So what to do when your product is held by immigration, held up by immigration because they believe your product violates someone else's IP? Um, I've had this when they held up our own product, um, and then it was just a matter of you know phoning around. But um, you can contact customs, but you need to know which area you're dealing with. So I guess you find out which port you're dealing with, and then get someone on the ground that has a relation with those authorities. Um, people can um, make seizures to hold your product, and I know that there are procedures for getting those overturned as well. Um, we've been told sometimes when we went to, we wanted to make seizures that actually, if the, uh, the uh, container owner pays enough money, pays, pays three times the value of the container, that you can also um, get a monetary release of the seizure. So that inside of China um, and then outside of China, yeah, many of the customs just um, have a dispute procedure. Um, and normally, if the if the container really is in dispute, the um, the person who's holding it will have you know a short period of time to file a court case, and if they don't file a court case, then uh, the procedure will be released. And when it comes to trademarks being used to stop product coming out of the country. You know, there's been some very creative ways of making it happen. Um, for example, shipping clothing, for example, shipping the clothing in one container and the, the labels that get sewn to the clothing in another container and then the labels are attached. Does that make sense? Or there is a label that gets revealed in the other market once the product's out of the country. 
you get the email, you know, oh, there's a trademark infringement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> how about, uh, how could startups and companies uh, use IP uh, law and protection to, to improve their company valuation? Yeah, so I, I do a lot of work with startups, and often startups are the only asset that they own is their own. They, they work in a co working space like this, so they don't own any property. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be renting their computers. Um, yeah, so the only asset that they have is their IP, and so if an investor is wanting to invest in, in the company, that one of the things I look at is well, what do you own? One of the things is the IP, so, and then what sort of what sort of IP is it, and how strong is it, how defendable is it, how can it be used to, to challenge infringers. Uh, so investors will go through that process of due diligence to see what, yes, you've got a patent, but is it really worth the paper it's worth or not? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a process that, that investors will go through. We've seen you know, big valuations of startups um, based on the fact that they were very strong in California. There's one company in New Zealand that's just sold to Apple for over 100 million, well, but up over 70 million US dollars. And they had a patent portfolio in, in the tens, maybe in the hundreds. And that was what Apple put a lot of value on. Technology led to inductive um, uh, power transfer, and these patents were really directed at the direction that the technology was, was developing, and that decided, well, we need to control these and own these patents. Did you purchase this company? Okay. So, there is also one thing that I'd like to add that uh, sometimes uh, some organizations, some, uh, some investment organizations, by startups uh, that already deal in the industry where they have a couple of startups in their portfolio and they eventually just hear them out what do they have and then tell them to their own, <laughs> tell them no thank you and then go to their startup and reveal them actually uh, what, what they found. So, yeah. so this is also kind of where, where startups, if they have some sort of strong protection, could, could uh, prevent that. Of, of yeah. yeah, I do a bit of angel investing myself and I'll go to investment meetings where you know, three or four startups will do a pitch to the investors. Um, if they are going to really detail about the technology they need, they are best to have you know, their IP in place already. Um, but startups can still pitch without reviewing the technology and just talk about what the technology can achieve uh, rather than how it achieves it. And that's usually okay before putting in place the IP that's necessary. But it's, it's, it's a balancing act, because I kind of need the money to pay for the patents. Uh, so it's, you know, it can be better. Okay. Uh, okay. We already covered a little bit about uh, uh, IP enforcement in China, outcomes, risks, uh, but uh, would you like to comment additionally on that? Like, uh, what, uh, what can people do uh, from outside of China to stop product that is coming out of China? So. Yeah, so, so I guess um, this is what we were talking about earlier about having a, a fairly vast um, international IP portfolio. Um, so that if, if there are copies coming out of China, then you are in time to be able to stop um, in the other markets. Um, so typically a utility patent might take you know, two or three years to get through. Um, and if you are competing against people making copies, uh, then by the time that patent gets through, it's too late. Um, so there are you know, short-term patents, utility models, uh, registered designs, copyright registrations, all these types of IP that you can get in overseas markets, uh, which will come into force very quickly, um, and they can help to, to deal with, uh, to stem the flow of products that's coming up. Um, if you have very specific uh, 
shipment information, so if you know the source of where it's coming into China, um, you can file uh, with the EU IPO some pan European, um, so trademark and design rights. Um, if you can narrow it down to a particular um, source, you can then get a pan European uh, injunction to keep all products from that source out, out of Europe. Um, so that can be, you know, a very useful Europe-wide tool um, that can stop the product from getting in. So even if it leaves China, it can't get into Europe. Um, and similar uh, in the US, the, the, the US will allow the enforcement of general exclusion orders. And so a general exclusion order is something that you have to obtain uh, by taking a case through the International Trade Commission. Uh, but once the International Trade Commission um, makes, makes a ruling that all, all uh, copies of your product, no matter what source, need to be excluded from the US, um, then the US customs can act uh, to try and keep product out um, you know, on a large scale basis. Uh, so we already talked about what do you need to work with customs authorities in China to stop copies of your products. Yep. Okay. Yeah. For uh, outgoing customs notices in China, yeah, we're finding that trademarks and registered designs are probably the easiest forms of like rights to understand. Whereas if you had a patent, uh, it's very difficult for the customs officers to interpret. Yeah, they spoke of the patent. Whereas for a trademark, you're looking at the image or the brand. For a registered design, you're looking at the picture or the product. Yeah, but that's for a good comparison. If you have patent, you can actually uh, uh, sue someone to be all the all what they sold in the past, right? So, yeah, it's, it's the same as the other Yes, but if you have a patent and you take it to customs, then I'll be yeah, yeah, yeah. that they won't do anything. Yeah, they'll be confused. Um, but yeah, I think the thing about customs in China is it just it requires really, really specific information about what where the product is coming from and what time or which port is going to arrive at. So you need to uh, run investigations to gather all of that information uh, before you start a customs. Yeah. So would you, would you recommend clients to file design patent if they want to file a patent also to file design? It's for a, a technology that has a, a physical appearance. The software you do, you wouldn't be kind of uh, but for hardware for products. And in particular, if the product shape is, is something that is driving customers to buy the product, it's really important. But it's easy to say around that product, right? So, but uh, at least it's not a factory that I have to take it. So, uh, from my perspective, I don't know if I right or not, but this is a good uh, good way to well, actually one of the tries you can have to, to, to prevent factories who will buy tool, tools from molds to, to, to uh, use your molds to produce more units, at least some scope of production. Um, Did you have those cases actually? So I, I think this comes up to be right, that you can um, okay. prevent factories from yeah, but if you have exactly that someone enforced a uh, uh, user of uh, uh, his or her uh, mold through to design patterns. Um, yeah. I, I we would normally I think if we would have put it down as a copyright matter if it was about the mold itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair enough. Okay, so Oh, do you mean the product that you that yeah, they exactly. produce? Yeah, okay, yes. So you would have a design panel um, on the product and then because they are making you sell on something which is in the scope of your design registration, then yes, you could seize all that product and so on. So, uh, so would you recommend that if someone wants to uh, base the, this, this, I know it's a weak uh, protection, but it is certain protection on uh, design patent. So, would you recommend someone, for example, to file a design patent in the US or in China? What is actually easier to defend in Europe? I mean, by the time it gets to the US for Europe, then it's with China, which means you're not dealing with the root problem. Mm -hmm. um, but you get, I uh, think Europe's quite good for quick injunctions and those kinds of things. Um, so it might be faster to take action in the US or Europe under certain circumstances. Um, but you know, it, but it, 
ideally you want to do both. So you want to have the option to stop it in China. Before it is actually, if it is to be one to stop the infringement at the source, you could be just even one defendant. And then we ask your Yeah, Again, I think that you can run cases at the International Trade Commission against like multiple defendants. So if you are having a rough time taking action individually against defendants, that there is a way that you can draw them all into one lawsuit and kind of get in all of the blanket covers more than one defendant at once. What would be the cost of such a question? Yeah. Um, those cases, I think, are about 300 to 400,000 USD, and that's assuming that you pick defendants who aren't going to front up to defend themselves. So you typically run those cases against small defendants that would turn up for the international trade. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, Okay, I think a lot of the things that have been covered, you, you made a good effort um, as a facilitator to involve the sort of startup perspective. I think we're hearing a lot of things about sort of the large company perspective and also the sort of um, mass produced product to a consumer market perspective where maybe there's like a lot of IP level value on, on the goods. Um, uh, I come from a startup which is more uh, technology value and instead of selling the product to uh, customers, we're using it ourselves. So the way that that fits into not only the Chinese, but maybe the sort of global IP landscape might be a bit different. And I just wanted to ask, like, uh, actually maybe Nikki, like, I know your experience is from the other side, but like, so we have a, 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 a patent at the moment, which is a preliminary uh, business method patent covering um, you know, our sort of like early stage step at establishing a completely new business method in a sector that is quite established. Uh, and we've got multiple invention patents that we're waiting to file um, based on, you know, hopefully some reference to that filing date. What I'd like to ask to you is, um, you know, to what extent do you see the enforcement mechanisms that have been discussed today like within this discussion as being useful for a company like ourselves, where maybe our financial resources, they're all right, but they're not at the level of huge companies that can afford to deploy half a million dollars on a legal battle. How much protection can we expect? And to what extent does it make sense for us to, to really, you know, maybe file those things twice, once maybe, out of the country in English and once maybe inside the country in Chinese. I mean, we're, we're, we're at a point where, you know, the resources are limited. What would your recommendation be, given the fact that you, you've kind of spent this time in the country with international brands, seeing the, the enforcement side and, and also like private investigation to support that? It seems like your experiences could be very interesting to companies in our position. Um, yep, yeah, I am normally dealing with consumer goods, so we're making a lot of them, um, and we're trying to stop people making identical copies um, going out of, of the country. So that's a slightly different ball game to trying to cover your tech um, and protect your market right. position. But I mean, you've got to have protection. You've got to buy it somewhere because, like, otherwise, how are you going to protect your business? Uh, you're based in China, so it makes sense to have some protection in China. Um, and then, at, at a minimum, you cover your major markets so that if anyone is competing against you, you've chopped up the world so that they can't get in there. So even with our you know, very basic brands, you might do China, US, and Europe. Well, then you've got a lot of bang for your buck there once you've drafted the initial patent specification. Like that's where a lot of the cost is in preparing a good base specification and you're going to need that no matter what country mm. uh, file. So that, that covers like invention and the other yeah. kinds of patents. Do you have any perspective on business method patents? I mean, we had the discussion earlier about valuation and I really, really feel the ambiguity 
around the provisional business method pattern is awesome from the like yeah. startup perspective. Yeah. Talking to investors, you're like, well, we have this ambiguous thing that could cover all sorts of stuff, and the, you know the investors love it because it, you can you can fudge it in any direction required, and there's still scope to do that legally. What about the enforcement, though? I mean, it just seems like a big question mark. So, but once you so you start broad, right, and you give yourself a lot of places to go if you want the provisional pattern, and then by the time you get to enforcement, you will have crystallized it out into specific conventions that are very commercially important for you. Mm -hmm. So the thing you want at the best level is you want it to be broad because no matter what you're interested in, you can pivot to cover it. Right. So but for the purpose of the recording, though, I mean, I think that like my own experience, uh, having paid for some very professional uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> advice, is that. Um, the, that was actually the best thing that I think we did as an early stage startup was pay money for a business method pattern and that might not be viable for all businesses but if you're doing something where that might make sense I think for us in terms of justifying evaluation not just to initial investors but to like additional investors coming on board looking at what you might or might not have I don't necessarily agree with Anton's reduction where he said uh, all you've got is your IP. I don't think that's true. I think investors see, you know, they see a team, they see a history of execution, they see a lot of other things. Uh, they see, you know, like uh, efficiency around burn rate, things like that. But when you add it all together, I think it makes a lot of sense for them when they can see something uh, on the cards legally. So yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're going to say what is going to keep, what is going to stop their business not working. Well, I mean, like we're talking about businesses that are pre-revenue, so they're not even worried about, you know, uh, is is there going to be a copycat? They're worried about, like, can I actually get to the point where I'm generating it? You know, and so, you know, for us, the point was we needed to shop out the concept extensively to get the money in the door, and for that reason, we needed to to actually put some money down, and it, it felt like it was a good. Option. I think uh, in hindsight at this point, having now successfully raised, um, it was definitely a good decision. So for anyone listening to the recording, which I know this is going on, it's a good decision. If it work, makes sense for your business, do it. Um, yeah, to, <laughs> to follow up on that, that was how I became a patent attorney, it was basically wanting a patent application for a business idea and not being able to spend the money on it. And I thought I should learn how to do this. I didn't fully, <laughs> fully back that yeah. And then the value of the pet to the business right now will change over time. And the, chip, the technology may go in a, in a different direction. Um, your, I mean, your business model is going to start generating a lot of data. And I'm seeing more and more companies relying on data as, as the, the most valuable IP that they own. And that's IP in the form of trade secrets that they don't share with anyone else. And that gives some efficiencies in the business and the delivery and the execution. We've already had very large companies, uh, like globally significant companies, approach us on the potential that we would be generating that kind of information and they want to get us into the fold already before we've even entered the market purely on the potential of those sorts of trade secrets, which to me was incredible. They've almost ignored the technology and its intended purpose. They just want to spy on the population. <laughs> this is a very, very strange thing. For, for trading purposes, you know, to, to preempt, uh, as signals to preempt uh, macroeconomic signals. I incredible. Very, very unexpected. Is it? <laughs> okay. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a bit more? Uh, thanks, for uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, attending trade shows for, for IP enforcement in China? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what, what um, so again, so having some registered rights to uh, having a certificate is a great start. Um, it depends if you are going to the trade show to find leads for people that you actually want to take to court and try and shut down a, a large scale operation, um, then you are best to have um, a, a Chinese attorney with you because they can take notarized evidence. So if you're trying to get evidence from the trade show for a later court proceeding, um, then there's formalities around that. 
and it's good to take someone who really knows what they're doing. Um, there are the, the law firms up here, um, Ralphs, etc., offer uh, trade show monitoring services, so they'll have lawyers um, that will go around so you can leave them with your rights and they will go um, and make takedowns. But you don't actually have to get someone else involved, you can turn up to the show yourself. Um, most of the shows have an IP office, um, and their job is that you go to them with a complaint that somebody is selling something that infringes your right, you hand over your certificate which proves your right, um, and if they agree with you, they will go and remove that product um, from display at the show. So they'll make it, they'll ask for it to be taken down, um, but they won't seize it. Um, but that's still pretty important when you think that at, at trade fairs, that anyone who sees and, and takes away a sample of that product is potentially going to place hundreds of thousands of orders. Um, so if you can stop that one event occurring, then you know you have quite a large impact for a small action. Um, so it's just a tip of the iceberg, but it does have a bigger yeah. um, it, You can. <laughs> We have sometimes not had resistance when we turned up ourselves and just started doing our own removal. So if you want to take the product out of the show, you can take the big bag and take your certificate. Um, and most, well, very often traders will just say, well, we didn't know we got this from a factory somewhere and like, we were intending on infringing anybody's IP and we're terribly sorry. Um, and, and sometimes they've even followed up with more information about where they've got the copies of our products from. Um, so, and again, you can go around and give your business cards and intelligence, um, and it's a good way to be seen um, in the brand, to be monitoring and enforcing. Um, so, the customers like to see us at trade shows um, going around and pulling things out. So, you cover that uh, for customers, right? So, like, each, time, each time you attend a trade show, actually, your customers have direct. Uh, use of that benefits. Yeah, because you know exactly which product you deal with and dealt with. Yeah, okay. yeah. How often do you go to trade shows? Um, all the time, like all the trade shows. Oh. Oh, well, we do Canton, like we go to the ones in Wondong. I think we sent someone to Shanghai this year as well, but normally we do Canton Fair twice a year um, and all the Hong Kong gift and toy fairs. Is that the reason to go to trade show, to check what's Oh, normally we, there might be a different stand, so someone that's not a legal might actually even be presenting it at the trade show. Um, but no, we literally go there to monitor the trades. Okay. Uh, it's time to crash. This would be able to walk around. Yeah, do you need, do you need this uh, like hoverboard or something? <laughs> I would love the hoverboard. I find, um, yeah, going to do the, the big trade shows can be really exhausting um, and the point is that you really need to make it round by the morning on the first day to start taking action because if you leave it too long you know the trade show is out of over so you need to be snappy about it. Have you ever read the new factories in China? Um, we have done um, surveillance to prep for factory raids. Um, our problem on that particular problem uh, product was not being able to find all the pieces um, of the product in one place. So our, our patent covered um, a product which involved a certain combination of features. Um, and so we can see some of the features there and some of the features at a factory over there, but because we couldn't find one factory where the entire infringing item was, um, we weren't able to, to make savings. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it depends on what your protection powers. So, so, you might be your protection on components and then it's something to think of when you're planning your IP portfolio. Uh, what, about, um, what about internal security? So, you guys have talked a lot about like registering things with the government, and I guess that's the core kind of business in IP. What about the question around uh, how do you manage your own people? So say you've got a complicated product with lots of value and you need to do that final assembly. How do you control that? Is there, are there legal 
uh, terms put in place, like in terms of like employee contracts, in terms of like structures of work, in terms of like shifts or delineation of responsibility. How do you best protect yourself inside of China producing things with uh, potentially very high uh, intellectual property value uh, without losing that to individuals. I know that there's you know standard approaches in terms of like a military approach might be to segment responsibility amongst multiple units, but beyond that sort of raw operational stance, is there a legal insight that you guys could offer in terms of making that happen more safely for a business? Um, I, I think Zuru hinges that risk just that we contract factories and they want to do work. Um, and so the relationship is that important for them. Um, that, that's how that risk is managed. So you're making sure they're making enough money that they're not going to allow big problems to occur. So you're kind of essentially shouldering that responsibility. Yeah, because they're doing many, supply. many lines of product with us. So okay. if they ran off with one line, they're not going to get any more. Right. Um, now, wasn't it really talking about like um, duplicating a line or, or, or producing additional volume? What I was talking about was, uh, you know, in our case, we have like many more on the trade secret side. Uh, and then, so a very, very complicated product with maybe potentially very large value. Um, we need to assemble it somewhere. Yeah. So if we took that third party approach and said, oh, it's worth lots of money, well, it wouldn't really work because it's not 48 trillion pieces. It's, it's maybe, you know, hundreds or thousands of pieces, but each piece represents, you know, millions of dollars worth of development and, and could go walking. So in that case, would you have any recommendations for protection? Um, I think that, like you said, like your, your contracts and your employment agreements, um, anyone that you're working with needs to be under confidentiality um, obligations. And that's, I guess, your legal backup, but you really need some, some practical um, measures to, to reinforce the legal backup. That's kind of what I thought, to combine every option and just hope for the best. <laughs> it's just doing your due diligence on the people making sure you trust them. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Know about them. Edward Snowden said, uh, "Policy is a one-way ratchet. It only loosens over time." I think that was very insightful. You know, you can you can start out with the best of intentions, but unless you're actively monitoring things and enforcing things, eventually you will lose. I think there are enough of our company people on the ground at the factory. So if anybody came in and out of those factories. So it is maybe part of the factory management is, is our management, and so we can, um, you know, they're, they're not public factories, even though they're not our factories, people can't just go through. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have like a couple more questions. Uh, let's, let's kind of speed up because we're running out of time. Uh, so uh, what are the most important factors to consider for trademark protection in China? Yeah, so having your trademarks in place really. Mm -hmm. So the trademark squatters don't have an opportunity to register your trademark in their name. So if you've got a brand that you're really wedded to that's really important to the business, register it in China. Okay, otherwise someone else will do it for you. There'll be problems. Think about registering the copyright and the logo as well. So if you have a logo as well as a name, about the copyright registration and the logo, because that gives you another layer of IP protection. Uh, there's some different rules around it, quite different rules in terms of ownership and, uh, and enforceability. Yeah, so those are probably the main ones. If it's, a, if it's an English brand, think about registering the transliteration in Chinese characters.
quite a big part of the Indochina and the Indonesian question. Yeah, as well as giving a good family. Okay, same question. Last two questions. Okay, uh, what is the benefit of copyright registration in China? You can, you can pay them um, some money for an extreme express uh, registration and it can happen in like five days. So if you have a trade fair coming up and you have no registered IP, um, then you can get a copyright registration and you might be able to do it in time for an emergency. Um, but like I said, there's some, it's a, there's some rules around the so you just Okay, so I think uh, if you would like to add something regarding registered designs, uh, before I add, should last question. Yeah. So I mean, registered designs are a very quick and cheap form of identification for products. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the advantages. Uh, the disadvantages are that they are limited to the particular shape of the product that you are drawing in the registered design information. So it's really there to prevent the direct knockoff of it. Whereas a patent's protecting the concept that sits behind the body. And finally, uh, well, there are still some problems with the Chinese IP system. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's um, too different you know, from overseas systems, but there are more, there are administrative groups and there are groups. Um, and the administrative routes, I think, uh, require some knowledge of the authorities that you're dealing with, um, and they're kind of regional, depending on which authority uh, you're dealing with. So I think that if you're not experienced in it, you might see that as a least predictable outcome. Um, but I think that if you were working in an area with the authorities, um, by the time you would know what to expect. I think that the IP protection system in China is really good. The IP enforcement system is really good. I think one of the biggest difficulties I'm still seeing is finding out where the infringes are based, uh, where the infringing activity is occurring, where the potential for things are to be. That's because it's such a big country. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good as well. Yeah, that's actually someone uses your mold, go to the and find that one. <laughs> it's like good luck. <laughs> I, have, I have a practical question on that. Because sure. what it is like, so how important is the quantity when, you know the Chinese, because I'm from the mainland, I'm from the mainland, so I grew up there. So I know how much, how important the quantity it is when it comes to like enforcing all of that. So, that my first reaction would be I would find the guy who is in charge in that legal system, whatever, not like funding a warrior, yeah, but maybe more importantly, I will look for that. Mm -hmm. So it's from a native point of view. So I just want to hear your thoughts in terms of how it works. Yeah, absolutely. And we would also find the guy and then we would get the lawyer that's the same area as we, the guy is as well. So, um, so, so again, so that they're more likely to uh, to have lots of the people involved. I feel sometimes if you try and deal directly, a lot of people will just not respond to a cease and desist letter. Um, and so that's why we need to do a bit more work tracking down there. Um, we've got some native Chinese speakers in our, in our legal team, and, and so sometimes they do end up corresponding with these. Um, and, and sometimes it gets resolved, but sometimes it looks like commercial legal thing. You, you want a bit more of a binding um, decision other than them just saying that we won't do it anymore. Um, to what extent have you seen translation issues come into play in terms of the interpretation of IP? So, you know, the same IP file in China translated or originally filed in Chinese versus you know the same IP overseas either you know originally in a foreign language potentially English or translated to English in those cases um, is there a kind of case history of misinterpretation and if so like 
how frequent is that and how does it play out for different like pattern categories? Yeah, I, I haven't encountered any translation problems. Okay. To the that I've handled. But that's because the people that we're using to do the translation do translation work every day in pattern language, which is well, is it then necessary? Like, I mean, China's a signatory to like the WePo, right? So, does that mean that if I'm in China and I search in Chinese and I find no hits, and then I make something, and then there's foreign IP that I'm infringing, but I'm not aware of it? Like, how does that work? It's still infringing. Right. So, do you need to file twice, or do you file once and hope for the best, or how does that work? So you, so you need to file your IP rights in the countries where you want an enforceable right. So unless, so despite despite like the notion of like international yeah. uh, co corroboration, in fact, you have to file once in every territory, and that's just it. And so if you file in China, it has to be done in Chinese, and that's just it. Yeah. So the international corroboration is that you can file once in one country. Date. You keep the date, that's it, that's all they keep. Yeah, but so your problem is if you, if you file in China and you get your date and then something changes in the translation, mm. then you might not be allowed to keep your date. And then the fact that you've gone and, and you start the telegraph. Right, if the argument hinged on the change translation, it could cause issues, but basically speaking, the collaboration established references the earliest filing date. Yeah, but in, if, in the market. if your earliest filing date is going to be your Chinese one, and you've got to file and all the other markets based on that Chinese date, and you want the translation to be correct, so you lose the date in all the other countries. Um, okay, random question that's sort of outside of the scope of, I guess, the general discussion is like globally, what percentage of countries allow you to just file stuff in English? I mean, European countries, you know, Eastern European countries, and so on. Is there, a, is there like a kind of general acceptance, or do you generally need to do the local language everywhere? Um, when Europe, the EPR can take German, English, and French um, as the languages that you kind of prosecute in, so you get your pen in those languages. Um, you have to translate it into three languages to file? No, at the end. Yeah, so you can have any one of those three languages when you're going through the examination phase, and then you have to have it in all three claims at the end, and then when you go into individual countries like Poland or Slovenia or Italy, then you need translations um, of certain parts of those languages. Okay. What about like uh, like Russia or like Africa or you want to translate into Russian? Japan. Japanese. Korea. Korea. Taiwan. Oh. And you, but you've got Spanish speaking countries, so you can cover a lot with the Spanish version of the specification. Indonesia? Yeah. But it all adds up. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm so looking forward to it not adding up. Adding up. Oh, no. <laughs> India is all English. Yeah. Is there any, maybe, uh, like a hack that you find in a, a country that is cheaper uh, for filing? If, you, if, if you're determined to PCT, uh, is it maybe better to start from, I don't know, Poland, for example? I think most, most applications are filed in English and it's filed. Mm -hmm. Because that version of the patent specification covers the largest number of countries mm -hmm. that will accept an English translation. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that that's 100% perfect is Obviously, so my idea is that uh, you can maybe uh, go for a uh, cheaper uh, because you don't know yet is it going to be accepted. Yeah. So maybe kind of doing this on a is cheaper so that you can actually get these 18 months. Yeah. So yeah, that, that. if you would like to add something regarding registered designs uh, before I have the last question. Yeah. So I mean, registered designs are very quick and cheap form of IP protection for products. Uh, so those are the advantages. Uh, the disadvantages are that they are limited to the particular shape of the product that you are drawing in the registered design application. So 
that's really the exit for me to really knock off on it. Because we have this particular concept that's applying it off. And finally, uh, what there are still some problems with the Chinese IP system. I have not sure it's uh, two different you know, from overseas systems, but there are more, there are administrative routes and there are corporate routes. Um, and the administrative routes, I think, uh, require some knowledge of the authorities that you're dealing with. Um, and they're kind of regional, depending on which authority that you're dealing with. So I think that if you're not experienced in it, you might see that as a least predictable outcome. Um, but I think that if you were working in an area I think that the IP protection system in China is really good. The IP enforcement system is really good. I think one of the biggest difficulties I'm still seeing is finding out where the infringers are based, uh, where the infringing activity is occurring, where the potential defendants need to be. That's pretty good because it's such a big country. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually. If someone uses your walls, go to them when I find that tomorrow. <laughs> it's like a letter like that. <laughs> I have a practical question on that. Because sure. what is like, so how important is supply chain when you know the Chinese, because I'm main, main, I'm from the mainland, so I grew up there. So I know how much how important supply chain it is when it comes to like enforcing all of that. So then my first reaction will be I will find the guy who is in charge in that legal system or whatever, not like finding a lawyer, yeah, but maybe more importantly I will look for that. So it's from a native point of view. So I just want to hear your thoughts in terms of of course. Yeah, absolutely. And we would also find the guy and then when we get the lawyer that's the same area as we the guy is as well. Um, um, so, so again, so that they're more likely to, um, to have lots of people involved. I feel that sometimes if you try and deal directly, a lot of people will just not respond to a cease and desist letter. Um, and so that's why we have to do a bit more work tracking down there. Um, we've got some native Chinese speakers in our, in our legal team, and, and so sometimes they do end up corresponding with these. Um, and then sometimes it gets resolved, but sometimes it looks like a commercial legal thing. You, you want a bit more of a binding um, decision other than you just saying we won't do it. Yeah. Um, to what extent have you seen translation issues come into play in terms of the interpretation of IP? So, you know, the same IP file in China translated or originally filed in Chinese versus you know, the same IP overseas, either, you know, originally in a foreign language, potentially English, or translated to English. In those cases, um, is there a kind of case history of misinterpretation? And if so, like, how frequent is that and how does it play out for different, like, patent categories? Well, I, I haven't encountered any translation problems. Okay. To the patents that I've handled. First, because the people that we're using to do the translation do translation work every day and have the language, which is... Well, is it then necessary? Like, I mean, China's a signatory to, like, the WIPO, right? So does that mean that if I'm in China and I search in Chinese and I find no hits and then I make something and then there's foreign IP that I'm infringing but I'm not aware of it? Like, how does that work? It's still infringing. Right, so do you need to file twice or do you file once and hope for the best or how does that work? So you, so you need to file your IP rights in the countries that we want an enforceable right. So unless so despite despite like the notion of like international yeah. uh, <laughs> co corroboration, in fact you have to file once in every territory and that's just it. And so, if you're filing in China, it has to be done in Chinese, and that's just it. Yeah, so the international cooperation is that you can file once from a country and kind of keep your date 
you keep your data. That's it. That's all they keep. Yeah, but so your problem is if you, if you file in China and you get your date and then something changes in the translation, mm. then you might not be allowed to keep your date. And then the fact that you've gone and, and you started telling Right, people, if the argument hinged on the change translation, it would cause issues. But basically speaking, the collaboration established references the earliest filing date. Yeah, but in if, any your, market. if your earliest filing date is going to be your Chinese one, and you're going to file in all the other markets based on that Chinese date, you want the translation to be correct because I'm going to lose the date in the other country. Um, okay, random question that's sort of outside of the scope of, I guess, the general discussion there is like globally, what percentage of countries allow you to just file stuff in English? I mean, European countries, you know, Eastern European countries, and so on. Is there a, is there like a kind of general acceptance, or do you generally need to do the local language everywhere? Um, for Europe, the EPO can make the German language um, as the languages that you kind of prosecute in, so you get your pen in those languages. Um, you have to translate it into three languages to file? No, at the end. Yeah, so you can have any one of those three languages when you're going through the examination phase, and then you have to have it in all three planes at the end, and then when you go into individual countries like Poland or Slovenia or Italy, then you need translations um, of certain parts in those languages. Okay. What about like uh, like Russia or like Africa or you want to translate it into Russian? Japan? Japanese. Korea? Korea. Taiwan? Chinese. Oh. We've got Spanish speaking countries, so you can cover a lot of the Spanish version of the specification. Indonesia? Yeah. It all ends up. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking so forward to it not having that. India is all English. Is there any, maybe, uh, like a hat that you file in a country that is cheaper uh, filing? If, you, if, if you're determined to PCT uh, a hat, is it maybe better to start from, I don't know, Poland, for example? Uh, I think most, most applications are filed in English. Because that version of the patent specification covers the largest number of countries that will accept an English translation. And so making sure that that's one of the things Obviously, so no, my idea is that uh, uh, you can maybe uh, go for a uh, cheaper uh, because you don't know yet is it going to be accepted. Yeah. So maybe kind of doing it somewhere where it's cheaper so that you can actually get these 18 months. Yeah. So yeah, that that works. But obviously, yeah, it doesn't really matter where you file your initial application. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. also so wild. Okay, uh, thank you. I, do you, anyone else, more questions? I do. <laughs> so, because um, I do have some questions about IP related to my uh, small startup as well. So, because um, the, the business that I involved in do have a lot of like, some designers, or they're not designers, but they um, working for a brand and coming up with logos and stuff, right? So, um, they need to upload it. And produce it on our own So we face a lot of questions when we talk to like talking to women that's just as well. Like how do we as a platform to protect these like images uploaded to our system? Is or AB is still from the well. So it's similar I, I guess it was similar to the social media, but maybe a little bit different because they kind of like we used to we used to like print it on something, like anything. So how does that how do you So your concern is that you might be printing someone's yeah, logo or, and if it doesn't belong to the person asking you to print it. Yeah, or somebody sees because that, that platform, um, 